Coming up next on The Jeff Curley Show, my new favorite book. It's called Love as a Business Strategy. I found myself reading this and crying on an airplane. I'll tell you why next. Many are predicting that the worst is yet to come, which is unfortunate, said one person here. Until now, they've enjoyed the reputation of being the nation's icebox. Watched a burglar in his home this morning by webcam. As a journalist of over 25 years, stories are what make my world turn. Reporting live from the Dallas Newsroom tonight, Jeff Crilly, Fox 4 News. But in 2008, I took the jump from my familiar life and started a PR firm from my home. We're talking about anyone with a camcorder like the one I'm using becomes a television network. We started slowly growing the company and we now have over a hundred clients and we've branched into the world of live digital broadcasting. I now own eight different TV studios and have a huge team. And the stories that I now get to share are sometimes the most important of my life. Life has a funny way of coming around full circle. This is The Jeff Crilly Show. So I mentioned off the top of the show that I found myself reading this amazing book. It's called Love as a Business Strategy. I'm reading it on a plane and there's a section in the book that really got me uh, tearing up and I was just hoping that no other passenger saw me reading this. Typically you don't cry when you're reading a business book, but this is really the most impressive book I've, I've ever read as far as a, a business strategy and a blueprint for companies today. So I wanna introduce some of the co-authors of this book, uh, Mohammed Anwar, uh, uh, Jeff Marr and then Chris Petrie. Thanks Hi. for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank and you and one us. of your co-authors is not here, Frank Dan. Yeah. Very cool. But uh, let's start with you, Mo, because uh, you had a catharsis. You were running your company, but you were taking it in the wrong direction. Yeah. So <clears throat> I started the company when I was 20 years old and I looked to the corporate world to for my leadership style. And I was actually very successful. In about 10 years, I was uh, leading the life of a business owner, and I thought I had hit the pinnacle of success. But all of that came, came falling apart, and our business was almost on the verge of bankruptcy, and we were losing employees and hemorrhaging cash. And in a deep moment of introspection, I had this realization that this was all my fault. My selfish attitude, my behaviors had led to the situation where our company was almost bankrupt. And from that moment on, I committed to becoming a trusting, vulnerable, um, and empathetic leader that puts the needs of others before myself and creates a circle of safety for empowering a people to learn, grow, make mistakes, forgive one another, thereby creating an environment of resilience and belonging. And I'm still on that journey. haven't mastered it yet. Before we bring in some of the other co-authors, I want you to tell the story of, uh, of you in India speaking to your team, and you got emotional speaking to your team, didn't you? Yes, yes. Um, so when I began this journey about a year and a half into it, I had tried to change my behaviors, I had to tried to change all the policies, procedures. And so at a town hall in my Bangalore, India office uh, with 100 employees or so, I tried to take a poll and ask them a question if trust had improved between them and I. And uh, to my surprise, only two people out of 100 plus people raised their hand. And in that moment, I felt like somebody had just punched me in my gut and I couldn't contain my emotions. And uh, I left that town hall abruptly. A few days later, I came back to address the company. And this time I mustered up the courage to uh, apologize. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry for all of my past behaviors that had hurt them. I, I apologize for all of the policies I had created in the past that had hurt them and their families. And I began to cry as I was seeking forgiveness and I became emo emotionally unstable again and left the meeting prematurely. And then the last day arrived when I was heading back to Houston and uh, it, they put together a farewell gathering and uh, gifted me a book that said, we love you and we trust you more. And they filled up the book with messages of love and support. And I began to cry again. This time there were tears of joy because I had been longing for some form of validation for all of the sacrifices and the commitment to change my behaviors. Wow. And that's what got me tearing up on the plane is because I've worked for a number of different bosses in the TV world, and I don't think I ever heard an apology. Uh, Jeff, uh, let's bring you in on this. You remember Mo uh, before his, uh, uh, you know, reinvention of sure, himself. Yeah. Uh, what was he like? 
Well, I joined uh, Softway with Mo 10 years ago, and uh, he was always very mission driven, very focused. But, you know, I saw him as someone to look up to. I did. You know, we live in the American dream. He's driving fancy cars. During lunch breaks, he'd take a plane and go flying. I was like, that's like what I wanted to do too, you know? And then so I, I was watching him all the time, I was watching his behaviors, but the way in which he got things done was, you know, very authoritarian, right? It came to like, get it done, get it right. If something bad happens, you need to find out who did it, you know, cut it off, um, things like that. And so it was very, very stern, but it seemed correct. It seemed like that's what you do in business. And it really took uh, this journey that we've all been on really together over time to really get to this point where you can look back and see that really wasn't doing it. It really wasn't having the effect we wanted. And uh, uh, Chris, let's bring you in on this. Uh, you guys didn't just write a book. You're leading a revolution. You're going around the country, around the globe, really, yeah. talking to different organizations. Yeah. Uh, what's the reaction? Because you typically don't see the word love <laughs> on, the, no, you, on the cover of a business book. You don't. And you know the reactions globally have been remarkable. It's funny. Humans are human wherever you go. Um, and so when you talk about things like forgiveness and trust and vulnerability, those are things that everybody wants, regardless of who you are, where you were raised, the country you live in. I think people just want to go to a job where they know they're appreciated and valued, but also their bosses and their supervisors and the leaders are looking out for them and taking care of them in ways that remind them that they are, you know, bringing real value to an organization. You know, we hear people are our greatest assets, but that stops and starts at HR. Yes, right. and you guys really have spoken around the world. Uh, we're going to show some pictures of you out and about. And uh, you were telling me before the show began that uh, you were cautioned: don't don't say love in this country; they won't get it. Uh, but the epiphany is they they all get it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, that that's what really drove us to write this book called "Love as a Business Strategy," because as we travel the world met 1400 leaders from 46 different countries, different ethnicities, backgrounds. All of them heard our story of how we tried to instill a culture of love and they all resonated to it. They all appreciated it and they all wanted that for themselves, no matter where they came from. And they actually pushed us and said, hey, you have to share this with the world. You have to write a book. This message has to be shared with the world. And they inspired us to write the book. And, and Jeff, um, I'm sure there are people watching this right now who say, yeah, it sounds really foo-foo and -foo. I get it. Love is a business strategy, but it would never work at my company. What are you experiencing as you take this message around? Yeah, we love sharing the message, but we get that all the time, right? People come in and, and there's a skepticism around how this could possibly come true, especially since we all have our own stories, we all have our own context. You think about, you read the book, you're always gonna think about your workplace and your boss and whatever it is that holds you back. And we always tell people is that everyone has a level of influence. It may be smaller for some, larger for others. It may be a title that helps you have it, but no matter where you come from, you have an influence. And I think we often undervalue that. We under, under recognize the power of that influence that we, we hold. And so we try to teach through the book and when we talk to people is that if you can recognize your, your own influence and become stronger in yourself, your ability to actually express love, your ability to actually care for others and serve other people around you, no matter what your title or your role is, it actually matters less than you think what your CEO is doing, what your boss is doing, because you can always create this, this, this bubble, if you will, of, of love and kindness and whatever you want to call it, but that positive, positivity that'll actually drive culture because culture is not one person. Culture is not just the, the boss or leader. It's actually everyone together. And so you can start anywhere in the organization and we've seen it happen. And so the person watching this who says, okay, I, I get it. Um, can, can, do they have permission to go to their boss and, and say, read this? I mean, how would you suggest if, if somebody is working for uh, a tyrant, how would you suggest that they, they I mean, go to the... Find me on LinkedIn. I'll send, you, I'll send you a copy. You can drop it right on your boss's desk. No problem. I'll sign it for you. I'll write a little note for you. No problem. But yeah, absolutely. I think um, the, the book we've actually... The moments we've cherished after writing this book have been the stories of people who are like, I've been too scared to talk to my boss, but this book has made it real easy to just 
leave it on their desk with a post-it note saying, hey, check this out. We're like, it's a great in, it's a great in for you. But, but absolutely, because people, this, it's a tough conversation. We're not going to act like it's easy, right? It's not like you can just knock on their door and say, hey, let's add love everywhere. Sure. Um, and so we encourage two things, is to have the conversation, but also think about yourself. I like think even if you're looking at your boss and all the things that they're doing right or wrong, there's a lot that we can do. We have a lot of power within ourselves to be influential in the ways that we are on our own team. Just even if it's one person who sits next to us, it makes a big difference. Sure. Uh, Chris, you're passionate about onboarding new employees and recruitment. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what role does this book and your philosophy have in your life? Yeah, I think this is an important and critical sort of aspect of the employee experience. And to me, if you want a great culture, it starts with who you're bringing in. And we've learned that by really looking for originals and culture ads instead of culture fits, you can actually find people who with their life experiences and maybe not, you know, the the Ivy League education, but they have some really great life experiences and they they have these capabilities that are above and beyond even what the role might require. When you bring those people in, you're capable of unlocking so much potential, adding new revenue streams, launching products faster, whatever the case may be. Um, but it starts with hunting and finding people who align with the beliefs, with the values, with the ideals that you want to have and the behaviors you ultimately want to see. And you start interviewing for that before they join, not after. Sure, um, Mo. So love is such a you know all loving mm -hmm. word. If an employee is uh, out of line or not uh, living up to the expectations of the company and the values, mm -hmm. uh, is there such a thing as tough love, or how do you how do you have those kinds of conversations? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we believe in the concept of tough love, but even tough love when practiced. In, in a culture of love, it's done with the compassion and empathy. So when you're able to speak to someone, you know, who's not following the values or not performing up to the mark, you're able to give critical feedback without fear of, oh, are they going to get hurt? Are they going to feel bad? Because there's this level of trust and relationship in a culture of love that allows you to give unadulterated feedback for improvement because, and the person receives it with open arms because they know that, you know, my boss loves me. He or she only cares about my well-being, my success. So I am going to listen. I am going to take the feedback. And so all these hard conversations, which most organizations try to remain harmonious, don't, you know, don't give the feedback in a timely manner. A culture of love actually enables accountability and you know, holding people um, to their responsibilities a lot much more easier than in a regular environment. You bet. Well, shout out to North, uh, Success North Dallas because one of the reasons you're in town is uh, to be the keynote speakers tomorrow morning at yes. Preston Wood Country Club at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, we're going to have some final thoughts. So uh, let's start with you, Jeff. What uh, what are some final thoughts? What do you want to leave people with? I think I've already said a lot of it earlier, but I think. When it comes to the concept of love, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, the amount of time we spend in our lives at work is majority of our waking hours. Like we go to bed, we have some time with kids, but then most of our days are just spent working. And I think it's important to recognize how important that is to our mental health, to our physical health, to our the realities of how we live our lives. And so why wouldn't we want to improve that experience? I think it's so important for all of us to see through that lens that it's an important aspect. And we all are in this together, my co-authors and myself, for that very mission, right? To bring humanity back to the workplace. Because we think, we don't see it as just, a, oh, it'd be nice to have a more fun job. No, we see this as an imperative for the world to improve in so we can all better our lives. We see this as that type of movement. Well said. Chris? I think for me, um, when we hear the word love, sometimes we think soft. Sometimes we think optional. Sometimes we think that we're becoming doormats. And for me, love is really about putting people at the center of business decisions. And if you're a leader, if you're someone who is literally influencing and or deciding strategy, um, having your people, your talent, the people who are executing and driving profits at the center of those decisions is only going to mean success, but also resilience and belonging. Mo, we'll give you the final word. Sure. I think some, I'll, I'll share what I struggled with in the beginning when I was trying to go on this journey of culture of love was uh, finding 
a way to love my teammates and my coworkers. And um, I was, you know, enlightened that I couldn't love my teammates or my coworkers because I always looked for their weaknesses, their, um, you know, shortcomings, and I couldn't love them. And I had to change my perspective to start looking for the good in others and look for my own weaknesses. And so that would be my key takeaway is if you want to learn to love one another, look for the good in others, and in turn, look for your own weaknesses so you can become a better person. Outstanding. Thank you so much for coming on the show today and inspiring so many people. We're going to leave with the website, which is loveasabusinessstrategy.com. You can get it at any bookstore uh, and online. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That's it for now. We'll see you next time.